Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome, friends, to episode 30 of the Trauma Informed Lens podcast. Uh, today, I got Kurt and Jerry. The three of us are back together. And we're going to talk about uh, sort of a follow up topic on uh, one we presented a few episodes back on the window of tolerance. But a concept um, with my work, and I know the three of us have, have talked about this a little bit with the Window of Tolerance podcast, um, one of the outcomes of stressed out and, and traumatic experiences is rigid thinking and behavior. And so we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive on, on how that rigidity manifests itself in our, our clients, our patients, our students. But also, uh, whenever I talk about this topic, really want to uh, have us look at our own behavior as well in uh, the high stress environments we look at. So we're going to um, really focus on that for about the next hour and see where it takes us. So um, hey, Kurt, I'm going to start with you today for your bright, shiny object of the week. Uh, what do you have for us? My bright, shiny object of this week is that my hair has finally gotten long enough again that I can have a half ponytail. <laughs> I'm really excited about that. That's my favorite. <laughs> Huge accomplishment. <laughs> so do you like twirl it now? And yeah, I got to play with it. Yeah, yeah. You got the hair tie in there. I like <laughs> That's it. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> wow now, well, well congratulations really, really it is um that uh there is so much interest in um becoming better as service providers that i'm finding that it's really exciting to be a part of that um and people seeking out wanting to understand the trauma-informed lens and how that can benefit the, their organization um I, i'm just so so happy to be a part of of that and um for my connection with both of you in that in in sharing that information um it really is an enjoyable part of my life so that's a big bright shiny object for me very cool jerry what about you this week what's your uh, bright shiny object um i guess my bright shiny object this week is um mindfulness um, as I go and consult to organizations, um, it's very difficult for um, people in the healthcare industry who are, who are in some ways charged with um, helping other people heal to hold all their experiences, all the pain, all the suffering, um, why the organizations um, that they're working in or under such stress. And um, one of the um, skills that I think allows um, people to kind of manage that and still be able to um, be creative, innovative, and, uh, and kind of be present with people is mindfulness. And I, I know we did an episode on that. And um, sometimes after our episodes, I get an opportunity to kind of think about it during the week and uh, really the um, awareness of how to be present in the moment with people and also with problems um, that are facing um, is really, um, I think, allows people to remain um, that you'll talk about in a moment, but really flexible and open and curious rather than um, being organized by all the stress outside. So um, a shout out to, uh, to people who are working on and training and talking about mindfulness. Yeah, and absolutely, because we often see that the rigidity we're talking about today is, I, I don't know if I call it the absence of mindfulness, but, but it, it's sure one of those things, if, if we get caught in that automatic sort of response, um, we, we can get ourselves in trouble as well. So absolutely. And, and I would, for, for my bright, shiny object of the week, it's two things that I, I've sort of been fascinated with um, as I've been doing a deeper dive 
into behavioral management uh, literature for this project that I'm working on. And there was, there's these two books that, that I'm doing and both of them have similar titles. Um, and I'm not gonna mention one of the books because I really like a lot about the technique and approach. Though I came across this statement in this book is he, he encouraged educators to see that there is a three types of kids in your class um, when it comes to behavioral issues and the social dynamics. One's leaders, one's followers, and one he used the terminology of bottom feeders. And I, I just, I about got physically ill uh, when I heard that terminology. Uh, you know, and so on one hand, even though I think there's a lot of really great benefits to this approach, and this, this approach brags about 3 million views online, um, and I think there's a lot of really great benefits to it, it just really brings into focus that traditional model that we've had on how we view kids, um, that they're choosing these behaviors, that, that they are wanting to be a pain in our butt. And then, you know, the, the other book uh, or, or series of books that I'm sort of reading is uh, Daniel Siegel's books on the whole brain child, and then had a really good follow-up workbook as well. And and how, you know, with his mindful approach, and boy, Daniel Siegel loves his acronyms. I'm trying to get half of them memorized at this point, but it's too much for me. Uh, you know, just, just that empathetic approach to the, the understanding behind these children's behaviors. And so that contrast that exists right now, and it's nice to see that the shift is going more so away from the bottom feeder uh, label and more to the, the what's, what's happened to these kids and what's going on with them at a very a deeper level. So um, that, that has been uh, my, I, one, one reaction to the, the book I read was really devastating, um, but Daniel Siegel has brought me back in his kind, gentle voice that I hear on my audio books to a regulated state for our podcast. So th thank you, Dr. Siegel. Uh, with that said, uh, part of my readings with him has, has really brought back into focus um, his uh, duality. And I, I love his, um, he, he's an acronym guy, but he uses this one analogy, and I'm an analogy guy, so this is what sticks with me, about talking about this river of wellness. Um, and as long as we're in this stream of wellness, we're doing well, with his window of tolerance, he talks about being flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable, the faces. I told you he's an acronym guy. Um, but as we shift to one side or the other of this stream of wellness, we can either start to react and think in very chaotic ways or very rigid ways. Um, and I really love that sort of thinking as people get stressed, it pushes them again, like we talked about with the window of tolerance, uh, sort of outside of that into those alternative uh, styles um, of behavior. And so one of the things we talked about, again, just to refresh with the window of tolerance is, we know a lot of the areas that allow us to be flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable are damaged due to unresolved traumatic experiences. And so when we start to look, do a deeper dive into this concept of rigidity and thoughts and behavior, um, I, I just sort of want to get your experiences of how you've seen this sort of manifest in the, in the clients you've worked with, um, the folks you've worked with in the past, just when you kind of see somebody getting outside their stream of wellness into that chaotic, uh, he calls them the, the reads and all this structural stuff over here with the rigid thinking, what, what are some of the characteristics that you've seen when somebody's floated to that, that bank and outside their uh, stream of wellness? Jerry, you have any initial thoughts on, on this? Um, so, you know, I, I think the concept of, uh, that we've talked about in terms of um, stress and trauma, um, that it overwhelms a peop uh, an individual's ability to respond um, effectively and um, causes people to go into defensive strategies. Um, and those defensive strategies are what I think um, Daniel Siegel's kind of talking about, right? And so in some ways, um, we lose a sense of control mm -hmm. um, under, we feel like um, things are happening to us instead of us being 
And so based on our attempt to regain a sense of control, um, we moved to very rigid ways of responding to the world, automatic, both behavioral and hormonal ways of responding rather than um, in some ways um, thinking and making decisions and problem solving. And so in, in the clients that um, I, I work with, um, they have what, you know, what we might call a schemas or we, they might be mental models and that allows them to organize the information that's coming in rather than being overwhelmed by it. But it doesn't allow them to be flexible and to think so that, so that um, the models are helpful for them in terms of predicting and anticipating what's happening, but they get stuck in those models and can't in some ways um, be able to see what's actually here in the moment, um, which is what I think he's referring to as this kind of rigid rigidity. Um, where he's, they're not allowed to integrate information from their bodies, from their feelings and in their thoughts and make some decision on how to respond. They organize what's happening now based on a past experience and then have an automatic behavioral response to that perceived threat to kind of look at that piece. Excellent. Kurt, what, what about you? Some initial thoughts on, on this, this sort of rigid response to, to stress and, and maybe resulting from trauma yeah. for some folks as well. I think of um, something I've been called to treat frequently over the course of my career, which is running away from classrooms, running away from homes or um, residential programs. Um, that kind of that elopement issue comes up a lot. And it reminds me of a, a experience I had with, with some staff once in a, in a classroom. But they were recounting to me something that happened with a young woman who was in the classroom who uh, one day just wanted to leave the classroom and was standing in the middle of the room screaming, going, I want to get out of here right now. Um, and, and felt really like uh, at least what she was expressing was that the feeling she had that is if she didn't leave right now and follow that urge to follow her habit of running away from unpleasant um, events, uh, that she was not going to be safe. And she felt really this sense of impending doom, almost so, so intense that she felt like she was going to die if she didn't leave. And she, would, she was saying that to everybody in the room and just screaming. And one of the things that we did as a group while we were recounting this experience and kind of debriefing what had happened was a, a question that I asked one of the main um, staff and support persons who was interacting with this young woman at the time was, how did you feel right then? And he said, I kind of wanted her to get out of my face right now. And so it was both of them playing off each other and getting in this kind of really rigid space of, I need to follow my urge that has been a result of my, of my previous experiences to just go. And they, um, it's a kind of interesting interaction between chaos and rigidity, right? That the urge and the rigidity caused chaos. And that's, that's a, a pretty common experience that, that I have found. And, and that can be at multiple levels. So we can have it that big of a level where it becomes running away from a school or running away from um, a program, running away from a location within a larger campus. It can be running away from um, uh, like even a community-based setting, right? That, that, that kind of rigid, rigid following the habit can happen a lot, but it can also happen in the way that we think about things and that we get very, very quickly kind of trapped into um, repeating the same way that we have thought about a problem in the past or mm -hmm. thought about a solution to a problem in the past and get and get really stuck in that a lot. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, that's sort of a black, white sort of thinking, the all or nothing sort of thinking is something that you know, I've really paid attention to uh, since reading Siegel's work years ago. And one of the things that um, I've also noticed is I, I've transitioned because with teenagers, it's so easy to see the chaos reaction because that's just what's in your face. And you get so much of that and that's always sort of really on your radar when you see that because sometimes it could uh, create dangerous situations in the environment. 
you know, but, but when I, I look at this like all or nothing sort of thinking, and I see this then emerge in some of the adult um, work that I've done too in the HIV and other public health arenas is that there's some folks, um, and I still say it's probably a majority of folks in any program that I work with, but boy, there's some patients there. I, I see this a lot in the HIV arena where they know everything there is to know about their disease. And it's really this car, uh, compartmentalized sort of approach to their struggles. And, and the more that they can sort of organize um, and control in some ways, they seem to cope better a lot of times with stress. Now, sometimes I worry that they may be uh, sort of uh, suppressing the emotional parts of some of their struggles, but it, it seems like a, a really important coping skill for a lot of folks. Again, there may be some longer term consequences. And, and so with that, I sort of also wonder if you think about someone being raised in a high stress or traumatic environment, why do we see rigidity as sort of one of those things? I think we can understand why it might become a, a, a state per se as a reaction to trying to get some control over the environment that I'm in. But for a lot of these folks, it becomes a state. And I want to kind of uh, throw it out to you both, if one of you has a thought on this, is why, do, why is rigidity a coping skill that some people use and develop uh, as a reaction to highly stressful or traumatic situations? And wonder if you had any thoughts on that, In I certainly think about the concept of safety and that mm -hmm. one of the things that really keeps us safe are habits and established patterns. And those become really important when danger is associated with them. So that's it, from, a, from a, an adaptive standpoint, you don't want a lot of creativity when you have to deal with something that's immediately dangerous. You want quick action. Yeah. And so that's really a, a part of our, of our development and our, and our biology that has equipped us to respond to situations that involve danger, uh, to get out of them very, very quickly and do it very, very efficiently without having to take too much time to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Jerry, any thoughts on that? Um, well, I kind of want to uh, kind of follow up what Kurt said. I think safety and habit formation is an important part of that. And, you know, I, I think that um, in order for someone to um, engage the thinking part of their brain, that um, they have to experience the world as somewhat safe that they can allow themselves to, in some ways, disengage from the external environment enough so they can go inside and, and think about and reflect on what they're feeling. And so um, individuals who grow up in threatening environments, um, one is they have to really make sure that um, mistakes can lead to danger. Um, and so they become very, oftentimes you'll see a perfectionistic quality, a rigidity, about individuals who grow up and it, it doesn't necessarily mean acting out. It may be that person, that child, um, I've treated a, a number of uh, trauma victims that um, they were so perfectionistic um, and the thought was is that they couldn't afford to make mistakes. Um, and you know, this thought of part of learning is making mistake and, and then reevaluating and going forward and for them that wasn't an option. Um, to kind of think about that. I, I also think, um, you know, following Daniel Siegel's work a little bit of um, this kind of left brain kind of dominant kind of way, as opposed to being in the part of the brain that is able to kind of think and emote and kind of be reflective and kind of, is that oftentimes um, being stuck in that left part of our brain where we're analyzing information, seeking, um, to find solutions to things is a, is a lot of anxiety. Um, and so I think anxiety drives us to some of this rigidity and that when we see people um, engaging in pattern repetitive rigid actions, really um, sometimes we don't really understand that as a sign of anxiety. Um, the kind of looking at that, you know, we see it as... Um, in some ways, uh, a behavioral trait, um, a, a personal characteristic, 
but um, really redefining it is this, I think going to the flip side of safety is fear and anxiety. Um, and so I think that's why you see for a lot of the clients um, who have long histories of growing up in unsafe environments, but also for children who are currently living in unsafe environments, their anxiety doesn't allow them to relax enough um, to be open to what's coming. They have to anticipate and then have an automatic behavioral response to it. And oftentimes, because they're so quick, they misinterpret their experience. And in misinterpreting, they uh, people with um, nervous systems that are in some way sensitized to threat, they see novelty as dangerous. Um, and so really, um, in, in order to change, we have to move to novelty. Well, these individuals have to stick to pattern, um, repetitive kind of behavioral ways of acting and thinking as a way of um, avoiding this sense of uh, fear and anxiety of, of, of novelty. So transitions, um, changes in the environment really create um, a sense of instability in them. Yeah. Well, and I think that the, the perfectionism piece is something that, again, with, with diving into the trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive school um, literature, even though it's pretty small right now, I, I thought it was really fascinating, a few, a few things when we looked at, at students. And sometimes students coming out of these uh, high-stress, traumatic situations actually thrive in school. And in some ways, I think that this, this perfectionism is, on one level, incredibly beneficial to them as far as pure academic achievement is concerned. And, but there's the other side that, that I'm seeing in the research as well, is that if I don't have that academic success somewhere along the way, and I like, I kind of relate this to my experience as well as being a perfectionist in my own right at times, um, though my wife would not say cleaning the house, I, I apply that to by any stretch of the imagination. But it's somebody really chaotic. Yeah, that's chaos. <laughs> Although I've gotten trained really well. Uh, Kurt would be proud of my wife. You should have seen the apartment before Sarah and the apartment after Sarah. It was <laughs> I learned you can pick up your clothes. Like it just made sense that they were on the floor. But so a little rigidity for me in that realm was good. But but as a perfectionist, what I realized is that I got some good grades and good feedbacks early on and my parents really rewarded me for that and I got hungry for more and more and that eventually turned into a lot of student loan debt um, and a couple of degrees. You know, but so there's on one side, this can actually, I, I don't know if I'd call it functional, but at least from an academic achievement perspective, it's, it's you know, a whole lot better to be getting, you know, A's and B's and just having all this anxiety but achieving than the other side of the coin, which I find incredibly devastating, is a lot of the kids that are, are struggling in schools and seem unmotivated also seem to have this rigid response. But what they've learned is that no matter how hard they try, they always come up short. So if you can imagine giving everything you have on an assignment and getting a D or an F or a smile or a frowny face or whatever you get at the developmental age that they're at, and you get this constant feedback. And here, Kurt, I'd love to hear your, your thought from a behavioral perspective. You try hard, you get the negative feedback. You try hard, you get the negative feedback. Eventually, what I've seen coming out of some of the research is all they feel they have control over is whether or not I try again. And so if you think about these kids, and this just breaks my heart, that they want the, the A or to achieve as much as I did, but all the, they, they internalize that they couldn't control their letter grade or their feedback. What they could control is whether or not they showed up for the test or did the homework assignment. And it seems to have become easier for them not to try and not and get a bad grade than to try their hardest and be told it's not good enough. And I, I'm interested, Kurt, from your behavioral perspective, what, what, what are some of the things you think might be, be going on there that, um, again, for some kids, that reinforcement of a good grade seems to work really well, at least on the academic achievement level, um, where other kids fall into this really devastating downward cycle as it comes to school and, and that can translate into other areas as well. I think 
several things. One of which is, yeah, you can laugh at me, Jerry. <laughs> the question is, Kurt. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many times Jerry's looked at me and said, you think a lot of things, man. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of things. <laughs> I think a lot of things. <laughs> That's why we make a good threesome. <laughs> <laughs> One question is, as a, as a bunch of treating professionals, right, is always to ask the question, are we, are we providing experiences to children um, and people in general that, that we're involved with, with treating that they can handle and that are beneficial to them? Mm -hmm. And for some, for some children, they may be at the stage when a result is, and praising a result is important to do. And there may be others where praising effort is what's needed and what they need to really generate progress is, a, is for us to adjust our intervention and do it at the right time to make an experience that, that works for them. Mm -hmm. And as you were talking, the other kind of thing that I was thinking about rigidity was how often I see that happen to the group of professionals surrounding a child or surrounding a family and how quickly we as a group become very rigid in our thinking about what's going to be helpful to them. Mm -hmm. And I think managing that is, is very critical and maintaining us as open, curious, flexible in, in how we're providing experiences to, to those people. Absolutely. And, and Jerry, I, I want to, any thoughts on this as well as to add the piece in there too, is that, um, because I think it's important to understand, is that when they study the individuals who are high performing that have a, that score high on the adverse childhood experience uh, study, they also saw that these kids were very anxious. Um, so even though they were achieving the A's, the B's, the, the, the better academic performance, with, when they measured their cortisol levels, sometimes these were very dysregulated, if not off the chart. So we saw even a cost to the success that was disproportionate to somebody, again, with a lower adverse childhood experience or, or, or no trauma um, in their life as well. And, and Jerry, I'd love to get your thoughts on this and also throw out kind of another question as well about how, I know Daniel Siegel talks a lot about how this rigidity at his extremes can also become mental illness as well when we look at different disorders and just any thoughts on, on the, the topic, uh, any more on perfectionism, but also how this can manifest itself as mental health issues if not uh, treated and supported in a, in a healthy way. Well, I, you know, I, I think um, um, mental health is really our way of organizing what's going on, right? It's, so it's, it's a categorization that we're trying to make sense of what's going on with individuals. Um, and as we know, our current models of uh, diagnosing um, people with different diagnoses may have way more in common with each other than people with the same diagnosis, right? Because you have a whole list of and options and kind of looking at that, right? And so, you know, people with trauma, um, lots of people with depression um, have re-experiencing memories that they have to kind of look at that, right? So, you know, I, I want to kind of differentiate, I think, um, you know, Dan Siegel does a great job of talking about when you start splitting up these diagnostic categories, you can begin to organize them not based on individual pathology, but where they fit on this continuum of rigidity versus chaos, it's kind of thinking about that, right? And so when we start looking at, um, you know, um, this concept of mental illness, I think we can kind of begin to look at it as when people move to the extremes of being unintegrated um, and they are trying to cope with internal and external experiences, when those, when those ways of coping become either due to their own constitutional vulnerability or because of the ongoing environment, you know, there's probably some combination of those things or genetic um, vulnerabilities, a number of those things, 
they begin to get organized in waves of um, responding to the world and responding to their um, internal experiences. So people with um, obsessive compulsive disorders, people um, who tend to be, um, you know, with depressions ruminating and constantly thinking about those kind of rigid kinds of ways of responding in a pattern repetitive way become um, what we would call it's clinically significant um, to do it. But you could see people who fall on that continuum may not have a clinical significance, but they have personality styles that are somewhat rigid that kind of manifest those things. So you, you know, you could be very, as you said, Matt, very perfectionistic, not to the point you're obsessive yet, but really it's very adaptive to you. Um, and so on the, on the other extreme, and you see people with trauma who flip from being overly controlling and rigid to being disorganized and highly emotional. So I, I think we ought to, I, I mean, in, in some ways, think about these as continuums yeah. rather than discrete uh, diagnostic categories. And that um, what we have to be able to do is, you know, f this starts out um, when you kind of think about it is in, in our attachment history, right? So um, we start out depending on someone outside of ourselves to help us but one is help us cope with um, painful internal states to be there to help us soothe it. Um, the other one is help us to manage um, and amplify high arousal states, right? Feeling good and positive to kind of, so that when, when we're, you know, ch infants or toddlers and we're getting excited and we get too excited, we need somebody to help us to kind of manage that. So the extreme of managing painful internal states and the other one is managing high arousal states to kind of look at that. The other thing really is shifting from one state to another, right? So these are the things that we learn in the context of social relationships growing up. But when we have difficulty managing internal states or being able to manage those begin to fall what we fall into these categories. So you can have this manic depressive person who can't manage those states. Um, or you have a depressive person who can't get from a negative state back to a positive state. Right? So what starts out into personal, co-regulated, bi-directional becomes internalized as a, as a lack of available resources. And people with trauma who, um, or adversity, what we know is it's not the adversity per se, but it's the adversity without the availability of a regulating other mm -hmm. to kind of help us to kind of look at. So these children that come to school who are faced with, um, as you said, continued failures, I think the failure is a component of that, but they also have an attachment history that goes along with what they're, how they're interpreting those failures. So you can have somebody who has a really supportive relational history run into some failures at school and see it as it's a challenge and I'm okay, but I'm struggling in this. You can have somebody else who sees it and fails and because of their history, blames it on the world outside and says it's the school's fault and it's not mine and I'm not doing it right. Or you have someone that says I'm not good enough and I'm going to so that how a child or later on an adult interprets those experiences has a lot to do with their history of how they've in some ways either learned or haven't learned or have been seen or not seen in terms of managing some of these situations. So I think the, you know, the diagnostic categories is, is, was our current attempt to try to make sense of these experiences. And what, you know, um, hopefully what we're doing is we're revising those and we're gonna get better at integrating what we know about it from behavior, from neurobiology, and then come up with, a, a, you know, something that more reflects our current understanding of, of some of that. But I think Daniel Siegel clearly talks about our diagnostic system falls into these two kind of uh, camps. If yeah. 
Absolutely. And I want to I want to talk a little bit more about sort of what Kurt introduced here in a second about the organizational rigidity that we sometimes see. But I want to just but before we transition to that, I, I want to talk about, you know, I, a lot of times that I, this is from my own experience, but but I feel like it's somewhat universalized is we spend a lot of time with our behavioral management sort of systems really trying to respond effectively to the chaotic behavior, that, that sort of extreme behavior. But, but sometimes the, the rigidity is a different way of thinking about things. I think mindfulness that Jerry mentioned as his bright, shiny object is, is one way to sort of help people get out of that rigid mindset. But I just kind of wondered too about if you think that there's at least a, a portion of the population in our classrooms and our residential treatment centers walking into our health clinics that, that are carrying this uh, rigidity and they associate anxiety with it. How, how do we help people sort of move to, from that, the, the far shore, as Daniel Siegel says, in back into their stream of wellness and, and well-being? If that rigidity, that coping skill sort of become a, a state that, that carries a lot of anxiety and, and probably some negative um, effects overall. So, Kurt, you know, I know you think a lot about structuring environments. What, what would, how would you sort of structure this? This kind of harks back to our last podcast as well as somebody who's, who's struggling to think in the grays, um, to, to think creatively. How would you help to, to structure an environment where that person uh, could also thrive? I was thinking too, well, while Jerry was talking about one of the ways that we benefit from being around others, especially early caregivers, is kind of resonating um, our emotional state off of that person, either amplifying positive things, helping us to manage negative feelings uh, when we get scared, when we feel unsafe. Having a secure attachment figure is really important when we go through those experiences. And when we have success and get excited, it's really important to have a responsive caregiver in those experiences as well. It got me thinking about um, a guy named uh, Matthew Knox's model of self-injury and that he's extended a lot of the behavioral literature about behavioral functions from just your standard four functions of behavior, those being attention, tangible, escape or avoidance and, and uh, automatic. And he took the social and the automatic and he extended it to be, he called them interpersonal functions of behavior and intrapersonal functions of behavior. And that those can be extended to, he applied it specifically to self-injury and, and self-harm. And I think it's a really, a really great model um, of, of a, helping us to extend our understanding of functions of behavior and the reasons why we may be engaging in behavior in any given moment. So thinking about your question then of how do you help to move someone from the rigid side of the stream or the chaotic side of the stream back in, closer to the middle of the stream is really to think a lot about safety and, and how do we engage with people to help them with both interpersonal and intrapersonal functions of behavior. What is it that I need to do to help this person feel like I'm here to help and that I'm not a threat and that they are safe? And there's a great, some great stuff from the whole brain child about that, about some specific strategies for what to say, what to remind, what like, I was there, you were there, you were safe, we're safe now. Like there's some really great stuff about that that really is looking at both sides of that. You can get onto both sides of that extreme and help somebody to get right back down into the middle, which is really nice to do on a moment to moment basis, right? A lot of, a lot of what we talk about, I think, and get into some conflict over in the trauma world and the applied behavior analytic world is what do you do in the moment? And then we worry a lot in, in the behavior world and not probably unfairly for me to say that's only in the behavioral world about, well, I'm going to be reinforcing the wrong thing if I do this in the moment. If I regulate this child, I'm going to be giving them what they want or giving in, and I'm going to create a problem. And you know, that, it may be true that it may be somehow creating a problem. That, it, that doesn't mean that it's not true, but it might be what you need to do to protect safety in the moment. Yeah. And so that's an area that I think there's a lot of fruitful ground for talk between both sides about how we manage those and 
a lot of what I love about what Daniel Siegel writes is he talks a lot about what's your goal in that moment is to help to increase cooperation. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of, and then, you know, a lot of what he'll talk about too, is he'll say, well, yeah, you got to structure the environment, right? Good structure really, really helps. And then he kind of leaves it at that. And me as a behavior analyst, I'm like, that's what we do. I'm raising my hand, reading that audio book, you know, listening to that audio book going like, I know how to do that. <laughs> so that's a great area where I think there's some yeah. fruitful ground for collaboration between the two sides about structuring an environment and making positive repetitive experiences, having lots of a highly rewarding environment and planning that out. And then what you do in the moment, uh, it might be, yeah, like we might be inadvertently reinforcing problem behavior in the moment. That's okay. Like, no, but like, it will be fine. We'll, yeah. get back, we'll get back to our structure and it will be just fine. Very cool. And I think if you come up with some acronyms, uh, you might get in. <laughs> so, I, I love, he's such an acronym guy. I, I, I can't, yes, but they're in my head, so I can't get about. But, but I think it's that, that and, and the difference between what I see in like the book that call it label of a good portion of your classroom bottom feeders, um, really looking at how we connect to understand folks in a different way and not just put our own interpretation on those behaviors. And Jerry, before we move on to more organizational self-care concepts, do you have any other thoughts about how we might help people move out of the, the rigid mindset and sort of work in the gray or at least be able to be comfortable with it in different ways? Um, you know, my uh, experience um, is that I got to visit their world, not ask them to visit my world. Um, I really, and, and this is one of the uh, challenges we have, is that all of us are fairly rigid, right? All of us have models of, that we carry around with us, um, some conscious, most of them unconscious, that help us put meaning to our experience and organize them. And that we sometimes confuse that our models are the actual reality, right? We, we, we think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm an analyst, so that's the way the world works, or I'm a behaviorist, and that's the way the world works, or, or you know, or I'm, but we do that in our daily lives. It's not just in our professional lives. And I always say there, you know, models are useful, but they're not true, right? It's the same way as looking at a map helps me know where I'm going, but it's not going to really be the same thing as when I go out and experience and to be there. And so my sense of what I try to do is um, I have some models that I organize and I have a number of models, right? I, different places I have to pull different models out to kind of, but mostly what I want to, my, my model is, is being open and curious to the person in front of me. And I think that when I can, be open and present to the person in front of me and not um, in some ways be pushed to being chaotic or rigid with them. That's how I create the safety for them to begin to see the world from a different perspective. And, you know, this concept of reinforcing the wrong thing is an interesting one, right? Because we wouldn't be thinking about if, a ch if an infant was crying and we're picking them up, we're reinforcing the wrong thing. Um, we may think later on when that infant was two years old to three years old and they're crying because they want a candy bar in the store. Now our goal is to socialize them and teach them something different, but we still have to kind of hold them and kind of write to manage them. So we, we forget about what is it the developmental need we're working on, not just looking at the chronological age. So I think Kurt's point is really well taken, is that um, when individuals come to us and they've not experienced a sense of safety in relationships, that has to come before some of the other work that we're kind of doing to kind of manage, manage that. And I think that that's where um, the map does help us. That's where the model does help us, is, is really understanding, not being driven by what the symptom is pushing us to do, but really thinking about what does this person really need developmentally in order to move to where 
um, I, where I think they, they would um, experience, be able to experience the pleasures of life uh, right now is what they experience is the sense of safety because they are protected and doing it. But that really doesn't allow them to experience some of the um, things that are rewarding and safe and, and growth producing in life. So um, I, th I think that's the answer for I would have to that question is, how do I meet them developmentally where they're at, um, both in an interpersonal, but also in the environmental, what kind of experiences do they need to be exposed to in order to help them to kind of feel safe enough to let go of some of that control? Absolutely. You remind me of a of an experience, Jerry. I think I it was, I'm sure that it was with you, and uh, it was um, early on in my experience supervising other clinicians. And one of the things that I would experience a lot is you you would propose an idea, or we would you know do a training on something, and people would tend to ask very very challenging questions, and it was a really powerful experience for me have you be able to kind of hang on to my feet a little bit and, and uh, help me to have a model for viewing those questions. And I remember one thing you said to me was, oh, they're trying to integrate it into their existing model. And it helped me as a model to view them asking me very, very challenging, very difficult questions entirely differently. Right. It wasn't that they were challenging me and it wasn't that they were not believing what I had to say or that they were resistant to anything. It helped me to view it as, oh, they're trying to integrate it. I need to help them integrate it. And I need to be able to stay curious and, and answer their questions and be okay with that. Um, and it, it's actually helped me a lot as a model, a very cognitive model, to have very different emotional experiences when I'm asked questions. And it, anyway, really helpful. You got me thinking about that when you talk about models and how helpful they can be. And also how it still it still can be hard to, to be in those situations, and uh, especially when it's public, right? When it's when you're up in front of a group and somebody's asking you very very challenging questions, even if you can think, oh, they're trying to integrate it, you're like, oh, I'm really worried I'm going to look stupid. Right. <laughs> hey, it's good to know that all the questions I throw at you, Kurt, are just you <laughs> trying to correct my my misguided model. So uh, you know, it's good to know what's really going on here. It's, uh, I'm really wrong, but you're hearing me well in my wrongness. So he's doing good, Jerry. He's doing you good. You know, you know, I'm looking at this and saying, you know, we're all on this podcast together, but we are insulated in our own little boxes at the same time. So yeah, yeah. yeah. We have our own we do have our own models, yeah. We're integrated and kind of that's a nice little metaphor. There. It is very nice. <laughs> so, so the last topic that I want to touch on, because I because I think this is one of the things is uh, when I travel and work with different organizations, one of the things I really have become aware of is the rigidity of the culture um, or the rigidity of the professional, especially when burnout is prevalent. Um, and I see this, what, what I worry about this is, again, as, as we get more and more stressed out, we and most of our audience, if you're in the helping professions or education or, or public health, we have a lot of power over the folks that we work with. Um, sometimes that's power, to, uh, power over basic resources like food and housing. Other times it might be we're the gatekeepers to life-saving medicine. Um, with schools, uh, teachers have a, a lot of power whether or not the kid moves on um, or, or what, whether they're suspended or not. And, and I've just seen over and over again, and I, I look back at my own professional stress and can see this as well, is this, it really becomes if that culture isn't managed and well-being's not a focus of the leadership or, or the individuals within the culture, just becomes incredibly stagnated and rigid. Uh, policies and procedure books this thick. That's usually the first uh, symptom I, I sort of look for. Show me your policies and procedures. And depending on the weight of that, we can go somewhere. But I just kind of, because I think if we're not, we talk so much about our curiosity, our creativity, our, our, the flexibility that we need to really meet someone where they're at in that moment, which is probably a different place than they were 30 minutes ago a lot of times for a lot of our folks. And, and I just kind of wanted to, to see your all experiences with this as well and how this, how we can help folks maybe, what, what are some of the identifiable things 
that, that we may be getting rigid in our work um, and may call for us to get back in that stream of wellness as, as well. Hmm. Hmm. So, can break down that question. That was a that was a lot. So, so, so I, I think how have you actual question manifest itself in the workplace? And so that okay, that's good, right? So, so you know, I I, I want to take it to a, a little broader kind of perspective. Is that you know for hundreds of thousands of years, um, health healthcare child care, education was the responsibility of the elders in a, in a clan, in a, in a, right? That, that that was a, and that the healers in those clans or tribes were very um, honored, um, that they, that really, um, that they understood they were taking on something, but they were also, of giving something back by status and position in, in, in the society to do it. And as um, we've kind of progressed and got into, especially in this country, capitalism, um, to kind of look at that, healthcare and education is more of a commodity. Um, it's more something you go and you kind of purchase and you get to kind of looking at that. And there, there's some pros and cons to that, right? But in a in a in our in a traditional model, um, there's always the people in a in a in the clan who are going to need more. But really, it's the responsibility of the whole clan to to contribute, even though some are going to take more. But everybody's got to be contributing, right? And I think as a culture, we haven't figured out how to solve these complex problems. So we, we have this capitalist model that really um, you have to purchase it. And if you're struggling, you pay more or you get less or something, right? So who's going to suffer the most in that kind of model? The youngest and the oldest mm -hmm. and the ill, right? So in, in some ways, I think organizations are struggling with this with the stress of trying to work in that context. So that, that is the mental model that we have as a culture. And then we're trying to provide care within that mental model. And it creates some stress in those organizations. So we have these ethical dilemmas. Do I really work for my client or do I work for the person providing the payment of those clients? Do I um, really, give this person what they need or do, am I pushing them to be independent and stand on their own? There's all these dilemmas that I think create stress that I think force us to kind of get overly rigid. Um, and we're not very good at holding both sides of those dilemmas at the same time, right? And so if you use the model of the river, it's very hard for us to stay in the river and just hold both sides of the bank that we have to kind of, not unlimited resources and we have to manage resources and we have to do what's best for the individual, best for the, for the organization and best for our communities. And we have to hold all those pieces. We get pushed and in, in our meetings, we get worried more about, are we gonna get sued? Are, are they gonna come and do these audits on us? Then really what the, and that drives us to writing all these policy and procedures, right? To kind of look at that. So I think some of the, the dynamics that happen in our organization are a manifestation of our society that we haven't figured this stuff out yet and that we struggle and that we don't want to really go back to living in a clan where we have these clans, but we don't really, our brains weren't designed to live in the world that we're currently living in. And so um, we, we try to make sense of it and the best way we could do that is write policy and procedures. Um, because we want to make things predictable. Um, but I, but I, I, you know, I do think that um, if we want to kind of evolve, um, it, the solution isn't going to be found in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, but there's some kind of party out there that's some combination of these things that are going to allow us to integrate that and create something new, not go back to the way we were or have this idealistic. 
So, um, you know, I think our, our organization's rigidity um, is really an attempt to kind of do what we're trying to do in, a, in an environment that's not conducive for doing what we're trying to do. Um, that, that's really what I think is, is it. So we, we get overly disorganized at times and we get overly rigid um, and that we don't just sit with the problems and deeply listen to each other and try to find solutions. We go back to, you know what, this is how we solved this problem last year, we're gonna do it again. Or, you know what, we're overwhelmed and it's your fault and it's the people out there's fault and it's like, right? It's like, that's what you have when you go to an org. As opposed to let's just sit mindfully and kind of see what emerges, how we can kind of solve these problems to, together to kind of look at that. Because I don't know anybody in any organization there are some, but most people, I think, truly are dedicated to doing what it is that they want to do. So they're getting organized by these forces that I think push them to these kind of positions. Yeah. You remind me of a meeting I was in uh, some, some weeks ago uh, where I was talking to a, a group who was thinking about designing a clinical supervision model. And they were designing it based on a bad experience that they had had with a previous supervisor. <laughs> so they were trying to create a new system, right? So they're saying, well, this, this, this person um, didn't ever go and see what was happening in sessions and had no idea what was happening with clinicians in sessions and only met with them in a coffee shop or out at lunch and yada, yada, you know, going through this laundry list of things. And they said, well, so we're going to um, outlaw any meetings outside of you need to be there with seeing what's going on with the patient. And they said, what do you think about that? I said, I think a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> but the question really is. <laughs> I said, well, really, part of clinical supervision has to be on maintaining a pulse on the health of the clinician and how that person is, is functioning. And the other is about skills and what that person is doing and whether or not they need, they need improved skills. So it's not that you need one or the other of those approaches, you need some combination of both. And the reaction to something that went poorly is to swing the pendulum all the other way and go, and we're never gonna do this one and we're always gonna do this one. I said, what you really need is an, a down the middle approach in that when it's time, you need to do this one. And when it's time, you need to do that one and maintain your ability to do both. So you got me thinking about that. And certainly Matt, with your question of thinking about rigidity, that's one that popped into my head of pretty good, a pretty good example of how we swing from one side to the other um, on these dilemmas. Yeah. And, and think about, you know, from the, a political standpoint, as, as Jerry was kind of going to, we, we have these big swings, right? Mm -hmm. Where we go, well, that didn't work. Let's go all the way over here. And that yeah. didn't work. Now let's go all the way over here. But really, it's about compromise and being in the middle and being able to hold both sides of, of dilemmas uh, most frequently. Yeah. And, and I think that that's so much just to add to this is that when we work with such sometimes chaos and uncertainty and we work in, you know, I think about the leadership in helping organizations, schools, on some hand, they're dealing with a lot of rigidity above them. Um, you know, state bureaucracies, federal bureaucracies, local bureaucracies are some of the most rigid ingrained systems that, that you'll find. Anyway, I've also found chaotic ones as well, but there are chaotic ones with a lot of policies and procedures. And, and then a lot of times when trauma and behavioral issues, mental health is what walks through the door each day, you're in this sort of sandwich between the rigidity and the chaos. And I think a lot of times when we see that chaotic uh, behavior, if we're not careful, we become overly rigid in our interventions. And we're somewhat supported to do so um, within the, a lot of the systems we work in, just go through a healthcare accreditation um, and, and see all those check boxes uh, that you gotta, mm -hmm. and the hoops that you have to jump through. So, you know, we're, we're in this really interesting spot where there's sort of this art and science uh, to what we do. There's, there's that need for curiosity and flexibility 
while at the same time making sure what we're doing is really working um, and, and is being proven to be effective. And it's just a fascinating thing that I don't think we, we spend a whole lot of time talking about how complex that is to manage in the best of situations um, when you're not worried about your funding cut or whether you'll get that grant again or all the other stress. And so I think it's just a really good reminder is to make sure in our stress reactions to environment or internal uh, struggles and dilemmas we have, that if we find ourselves being overly rigid, that it's a sign that we may need to stop and think so we don't ban all outside meetings for the rest of time. One of my favorite things, and Jerry and I, 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 I probably drove Jerry crazy with this, but Denver Children's Home, when we worked together, had been around for like 135 years at the time. And, and some of these policies seem to be from year one, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, but they became such sacred cows. And I saw this and they're, they're all over the place. And, you know, when I would ask people, and I, I still do this, it's a great thing that I've, and I annoy people with it is, why do you have this procedure? And, and when I hear silence, and usually the answer I eventually get is, well, we've always done it that way. Um, I think there's a real opportunity there for if there's enough, uh, you know, window of tolerance available, so to speak, to really consider things in a different light. But, but we can get highly rigid in that response too, and just have to be careful we don't get stuck in the black and white sort of thinking that our environment sometimes push on us. So very cool discussion. I've I also, since Jerry took us on a wild ride there, made me think about I'm binge watching The Walking Dead right now. And uh, what, what I love about that show is like, there's all these very rigid like tribes that have developed and all their rules that they have. And then they try to integrate with one another and it like never really works out very well. <laughs> and, and there's this constant stressor trying to eat them, which, which I think is just, that show is just brilliant. And, and somehow I got to tie my binge watching in over the weekend to this, <laughs> this episode. So thanks, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, I appreciate you again for joining us for the Trauma-Informed Lens podcast. Uh, Jerry Kirk, fun as always. Uh, maybe we'll have to have an episode just on The Walking Dead. But uh, um, I want to thank you all. And as always, we'll have some show notes, discussion questions, if you want to catch the videos um, at traumainformlens.org. And we'll see you next week for episode 31. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care.